From the 9th to the 11th century, the scientists of the Islamic countries had been leading in many fields as mathematics, astronomy, medicine, geography, possibly even social science. This was the golden age of Islamic science. After that time, scientific improvement in the Islamic world slowed down and nearly came to an end. There are both external and internal reasons for this decline. During the Golden Age, Baghdad and Cordoba had been the centers of science in the Islamic world. In Spain, the Christian kingdoms of the Spanish north managed to conquer more and more territory of the Caliphate of Cordoba in the centuries-long Reconquista. In 1236, Cordoba itself was captured and its library destroyed. In the eastern parts of the Islamic world, the Mongolians had conquered in just a few decades the largest empire the world had seen so far. In 1258 they captured Baghdad and brought an end to the Abbasid Caliphate. The citizens were massacred and all scriptures were thrown into the Tigris River. The third large library of the Islamic world was in Cairo. The rulers of Egypt at that time were the Fatimids. They adhered to the Ismaili branch of Shia Islam and were regarded as heretics by other Muslims. In 1169 Saladin gained power in Egypt. He brought an end to the Fatimid dynasty in 1171 and re-established Sunni Islam in Egypt. He pillaged the library of Cairo and sold the book in a public auction. Those were heavy blows against the centers of Islamic science and against the economical basis of doing science. But why could it not recover? The Mongol authority did not last for long and the Ottoman Empire again was a wealthy and powerful Islamic kingdom. The reason is probably that the intellectual foundation of Islamic science had changed. During the Golden Age, freedom of thought allowed scientists from different cultures and faiths to develop new theories. Many scientists based their inquiry on a connection of Islamic thoughts and Greek philosophy. This approach was criticized by theological schools that feared for the purity of religion. The most famous exponent of this Puritan movement was Al-Ghazali. Al-Ghazali is still regarded as one of the greatest if not the greatest theologians of Islam. And in a way he was. He destroyed the philosophical basis of Islamic science at his time and he managed to replace it with religious thought. Al-Ghazali was not so much against science. On the contrary, he acknowledged that medicine and some parts of mathematics are very useful for the society. He even called it a sin to neglect those science. But while he was in favor of applied sciences, he was a strong opponent of doing science just for the sake of gaining knowledge. Physics and some parts of mathematics that were not directly related to useful applications he regarded as useless and even as a danger due to their closeness to philosophy. He wrote a book against the philosophy at his time called The Incoherence of the Philosophers. This book was incredibly successful. Al-Ghazali addressed 20 failures he sees in contemporary philosophy such as the inability of philosophers to prove the existence of the Creator or the inability of philosophers to prove the possibility of existence of two gods. I assume the heaviest blow against scientific inquiry is Al-Ghazali's position on causality. It can be found in chapter 17 which is titled refutation of their belief in the impossibility of a departure from the natural course of events. According to Al-Ghazali, his opponents, the philosophers, claimed that cause and effect are necessarily linked to each other. One event will cause the other due to its nature. For Al-Ghazali, this standpoint undermines the almightiness of Allah. If the effect follows the cause necessarily, then how do miracles happen? How, for example, is it possible that Abraham was thrown into the fire but was not burned by it? Al-Ghazali accuses the philosophers not to believe in that story. I think he could have been right. 
Al Ghazali uses the burning of a piece of cotton to explain the differences in detail. He says, The opponent may claim that the fire alone is the agent of burning. It cannot refrain from going what's its nature to do after it comes in contact with a subject which is receptive to it. This means because of its features and the features of the cotton. The fire will burn the cotton if it comes in contact with it. Al-Ghazali objects to this. Fire is inanimate, so it cannot act on the cotton. And indeed we do not observe that it acts on the cotton. We just observe that the cotton will start to burn when the fire is next to it. We do not observe that it starts to burn because it is next to it. But what is the solution of Al-Ghazali for this problem? Who is the actor in the fire and the cotton situation? We say that it is God who, through the intermediacy of angels or directly, is the agent of the creation of blackness and cotton, of the disintegration of its parts, and of their transformation into a smoldering heap of ashes. All the changes in the appearance of the cotton are not caused by the fire, says Al-Ghazali. They are caused by Allah himself or by an angel commissioned by Allah. It is obvious that Al-Ghazali's explanation of causality ends scientific inquiry. Events do not cause each other, but do occur together due to Allah's will. Thus the explanation of everything undiscovered is already known. It is God's will. What I find quite interesting is that Al-Ghazali's explanation of cause and effect very much looks like the god of the gaps we know from contemporary theists. But while today this argument is clearly defensive, one tries to find a place for his god where science does not have an explanation yet. Al-Ghazali's version is much more aggressive and expels science from what is thought to be the realm of religion. An anecdote that is ascribed to Al-Ghazali may illustrate this. When physicians try to find the connection between the brain and hands movement, Al-Ghazali stated, hands move because God wants them to move. If Al-Ghazali is right, then no further inquiry is needed.